pleasure of introducing our next fireside chat, which is between Drs. Bill Chin and, and Rob Califf. And I'll introduce Bill in a second. And I know, Bill, you'll have some words to introduce uh, Rob, but I have a chance also to perhaps say a few things about Rob. We're, we're just so privileged to have Rob stepping in in his second tenure as FDA commissioner, um, first under Obama, now under the Biden administration. Rob has been a leader across academics, across uh, industry, and of course, of, within government. And he's been a, an advocate for science and for um, high quality clinical trials and for patients. Um, he's a clinical trialist by nature and has been an outspoken advocate for the use of real world evidence um, using the same disciplined approach that, that, that he and others and many of us have used in, in the clinical trial landscape. And as a, as, as a human being and, a, and ultimately a patient, we're all patients, we're, we all should be comforted by the fact that uh, that Radcliffe is is in the most senior position of policy and and regulation of of drugs because he really has all the right mindset and he holds all of us accountable uh, in industry but also in in academia we all have to step up to ensure that that medicines that there's innovation and that medicines are delivered to patients who whoever you are whatever you look like wherever you live whatever your socioeconomic means are so rob it's just such a privilege to have you as our commissioner and it's of course a privilege to have you joining us you're so engaged and you're, you're outspoken in so many different forums so the usaic is thankful and then i get to introduce again my friend bill chin who's been uh, a stalwart on usaic part of the board and since the inception of this group has been involved and prior to me was the mc of this forum bill is also um, versed across industry, academic, academics, and government. Bill is, was a professor at Harvard Medical School. He's an endocrinologist, a translational um, expert. He was spent time at Lilly and spent time as the uh, medical director at Pharma. But what, what people don't know is Bill was also on the scientific advisory board of my company, Takeda, when I first joined. And for the first few years of my tenure here was a great mentor and supporter of, of much of what, uh, what I started within Takeda. So Bill, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Andy. Good morning, Rob. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, you know, you don't need any more introduction for sure. I must say that you look good. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so that's that's that. The the format today will be what I call a moderated fireside chat, Rob. I have colleagues who will help me with some of the questions, and I'll call on them uh, when appropriate. So may I dare say, uh, Rob, you are the Grover Cleveland of FDA commissioners. Uh, I think some will get that. But Rob, this is a good thing. And you've been um, through, and I will paraphrase again, the best of times and the most challenging times. The good, there are great new medicines for patients and cancer, autoimmune and rare diseases. The bad, the pandemic, uh, which you live uh, partly through, high profile AD medicines, and most recently, uh, mefepristone. You lead an agency that has oversight uh, responsibly for over $2.5 trillion uh, in US consumption, or, or 20 cents uh, for every dollar spent. And you might sort of say that's actually underestimating it. So Rob, with this responsibility, are you having a good time? <laughs> Well, Bill, first of all, it's good to be with you all. And I, I'm looking here seeing my good friend, Naresh, who I haven't seen in a while. Um, and I will note, um, we're planning a trip to India in the fall. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Having said that, I, I don't describe it as having a good time, but I would say it's a fulfilling time. I, uh, you know, at age 71, I was having a good life living under the Golden Gate Bridge and working at Alphabet and the call came to serve again, and it's very hard to say um, no when um, it, it's so important. So, um, no, I, it, it's not exactly the same as playing golf every day, Bill, but um, uh, it's very fulfilling, and the work is rewarding and um, challenging. And, you know, as I'm preparing for the pandemic preparedness hearing tomorrow, um, you know, it's a, it's a good it's a good test of whether I have my mental facilities with me to deal with the challenges that we're currently facing. Very good, Rob. Uh, we agreed actually before this not to talk about methapristone 
um, it's very make uh, uh, statements about. So I would like to ask at this point, what else keeps you awake at night? Well, Bill, I was an intensivist cardiologist for 30 years. And uh, one thing you learn uh, doing that is you can go to sleep at the drop of a hat. So nothing keeps me awake at night. If you, if you ask me what I'm most, um, most concerned about, um, I think it's a, a division in our country, which plays out in so many different ways and which I'll be facing tomorrow in another hearing, um, which is fundamentally um, threatening the basis on which uh, the authorities on which an agency like the FDA depends to be able to do its job. And while I can't talk about mifepristone, I think everyone knows um, because it is in a court case, everyone knows, I think the circumstances there. And, um, you know, yeah. I am authorized to say we're, you know, we're concerned about the undermining of um, our, our basic authorities with some of the things that are going on now. Yeah, appreciate that. Well, let's get on with some of these questions. Um, I will start off uh, asking about accelerated approval pathways. Uh, so these pathways for new drugs obviously have both advantages and disadvantages. Um, and obviously this is very important to try to get medicines more quickly to, uh, to our patients. So how, how do you strike the balance between providing prompt access to these treatments and ensuring there's enough evidence to prove, pr prove safety and efficacy, and very importantly, to enhance public trust in the process? Well, you just said a mouthful, so let me try to dissect that. First of all, I feel like I always need to clarify that as uh, FDA commissioner, I'm a political appointee, and I think one of the most important things about FDA process is that decisions about individual products are made by full-time civil servants who are not political appointees and who are prohibited from having financial conflicts of interest of any kind. And part of my job is to shield them from the political interference, which can come into play. Having said that, um, I think every, everyone knows that my public record is uh, to continue to believe that accelerated approval is alive and well. Uh, the American public spoken through its elected officials to create a set of rules that say when there's a serious disease, it doesn't have an effective treatment. Um, there's a willingness to trade off some uncertainty for earlier access to a potentially beneficial drug. And the standard uh, for most of the accelerated pathways is that um, um, it, is that the likely um, that it's reasonably likely that the benefits outweigh the risks, which is very different um, than a standard of the benefits are proven to outweigh the risks. And I think um, I was very pleased that Congress and the omnibus bill just passed recently gave us what I think we needed to tune up accelerated approval, which is to really give us direct authority to say, um, you've got to enroll in your follow-up trial. Um, you know, and, and depending on the situation, it would be could be different, but we have the authority, for example, to say you have to start your follow-up trial before we make a decision to ensure that trial will enroll. There are certain times when that's not the right thing to do. We have discretion there by the law. And also sort of enhanced um, assurance that um, if a follow-up trial doesn't show that the benefit outweighs the risk or the company's not doing its job, we have authority to um, pull the drug from the market more efficiently. So those, those things are important, but I think the general idea that um, in, in America, we're willing to take a bit more risk in order to get potential benefit in circumstances where there's not a proven therapy. And again, just last thing to say about it, you know, I'm a cardiologist. So for diseases like coronary disease, where there are a bunch of effective treatments, you don't want to take that risk and substitute something that you think might be better when you have something that already works. You need to prove that what you're offering actually is um, meets meets that more general standard. Rob, we'll come back to that point in just, just a second, but I just want to 
uh, add on to this issue of, of the omnibus of bill. Um, th there is in that mandate um, the provision that payers such as CMS may have more influence on on the speed in which you do these confirmatory uh, studies. Is, is, is that true and will it impact on your approach? Um, so the first comment is that our authorities under the law are clearly distinct between FDA and CMS. We, um, our standard is safe and effective uh, with benefits outweighing risk for the intended use. CMS's standard is reasonable and necessary for the population that's covering with its, basically its insurance um, product, Medicare uh, or Medicaid. Um, but I, you know my history, I'm an, I'm an outcomes researcher, clinical trialist, and there has been a gap in the American system where the evidence has not been filled in that I think people need. It's not our job at FDA to require that evidence before making a decision about safe and effective, but I completely understand that CMS could make much better decisions if it had better evidence. And so the part where we can contribute is really on two fronts. One is now that we're moving into the world of real world evidence and the use of electronic health records, and we can do much more efficient, um, uh, larger trials that get the answers that we need. Uh, the baton handoff, as I've called it, between FDA and CMS can be better if we sort of tailor our trials to um, begin to generate the evidence they need. Um, and also, we're talking with CMS more frequently, so they understand the evidentiary basis for the decisions that we made, so they're not going in uh, blind. Uh, the yeah. analogy I've used is it's like a relay race. We don't want to run the first lap and then drop the baton in the dark and have CMS try to figure out where it is and pick it up and start running. We want to hand it off smoothly so um, they run the second lap. and. They don't influence our decision and we don't influence their decision. But in my view, the continuum of evidence ought to be a real continuum, not something where everything stops with um, drug approval and then uh, people don't get the evidence they need to make good decisions. Uh, Rob, I have uh, Daphne Zohar, who's the founder and CEO of PureTech, who has a question that follows on your comment about chronic disease. Daphne? Thank you. So my question for you is regarding chronic diseases such as heart and lung diseases, uh, diabetes, and also chronic conditions like depression that are serious, life-threatening, and impact overall public health. Do you believe that the accelerated approval pathways could potentially be used for some of these chronic conditions, assuming there are appropriate biomarkers? I I believe that you use the words could potentially, and how can I argue with that? Um, they could potentially, um, with the caveats that I gave, you know, let's take coronary disease where statins are highly effective and you have a new, new cholesterol drug. Um, if there's a subpopulation where statins were ineffective, um, and, you know, there are examples of this, um, you know, that's a case where an accelerated pathway could be used for a subpopulation that was clearly identified. But you're really bro broaching what I think is a much larger issue where we all need to work together and think together about how to do this. Uh, for long-term chronic diseases, even where we have effective therapies, most of them are not curative. If you look at the residual burden of disease, for example, from coronary disease, and of course, in this country, we're seeing an uptick of stroke mortality and a flat total flattening of the coronary disease curve. We need new, more highly effective therapy. So we've got to work together on how to do it. But as I said before, um, up to this point, we've done a really lousy job of taking advantage of the fact we've got 320 million people with electronic health records and more technical capacity than any place on earth. And yet we're in the dark ages of clinical trials and outcomes research particularly for long-term situations. And so um, I think this is fertile ground and we need to be discussing it. Um, I, I'm very excited, at least in my colleagues in the federal government, there's a lot of interest. So we're gonna be working on this, not just at FDA, but at NIH and CMS and 
uh, DOD, the VA. Um, there's a lot of things we can do to accelerate this field of endeavor so that we get more effective new therapies, even where we have older ones that are partially effective. Thank you. Uh, let me go on to the next issue. Um, this deals with new therapeutic and analytical modes in drug development, and we know them well. Cell and gene therapies, use of AI, machine learning, uh, model uh, uh, in, informed drug discovery, and, and including also advanced statistical Bayesian types of uh, models. So considering these advances, what steps has the agency taken to address them specifically regarding in two areas, expertise and manpower? Well, okay, so you're asking more about what we're doing internally to be prepared for what's yeah, happening. Yeah, I mean, there's so yeah. much out here, you know, so so it's going to take a, an army and you don't really, you have an army, but, you know, you have a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, we're up to 19,000 people now, but um, in these fast moving fields of computer science and um, and tech, so to speak, and you know, I feel somewhat qualified having spent five years at Alphabet about where the field is going and what's involved. It's hard, you know, people that are good in this field are uh, command uh, high prices, I'll just put it that way, and are quite mobile in the job market. So we are working on this. I, I will say, I think the work that was done in CDRH on, um, on, the, on the issue of um, algorithms and digital um, uh, product development, I think really hit the mark actually for a lot of what needs to happen. So I think we're off to a good start, but we've got a challenge uh, recruiting and, retra uh, and retaining people with talent in this area. Um, I'm thankful that um, the industry and Congress through the user fees and 21st Century Cures, which I had the um, privilege of working on, have given us special hiring and pay authority that doesn't exist in the rest of the federal government, and that will help. But you know that that's nowhere near what a talented computer scientist can get working in the industry or even these days at universities with the options for startups and all that. And so I guess we're, also, yeah, we're focused also, on it. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. And we have, a, you know, we have a senator, uh, center of excellence in CDRH focused on the digital world, and I think we got some really good plans. Um, not a, if you know what's going to happen with generative large language models, please let me know. I I, I would argue yeah. none of us know, and the acceleration, the exponential um, growth of the generative component of that really offers an amazing opportunity, but also a real risk that things right. could go by in ways that would be hard to detect. Thanks, Rob. Um, since this uh, summit has a focus on India, um, we have a couple of questions related to FDA in India. And so I'm going to ask Dr. Naresh Trahan that you know well, Medanta Hospital, to, to ask a, a question. Naresh, you're muted, so. Yeah, thanks, Bill, for the opportunity. And hi, you put me together with my good friend, Bob, Rob. Rob, you're very familiar with the yesteryear regulations of, of uh, research uh, in India. And you know also that we disrupted in 2013 and then took time to re reframe everything. And by 2019, we had a decent regulatory system, which has been quite stable since then. So there are two things that keep coming up. One is the stability of the regime that has been established and being tweaked in advantage in favor of what has been represented as maybe pinch points for international trials and also for innovation to come to India and actually exploit the potential that exists in India. So given that, this, that the, the regulatory is now stable and then there are some concerns about the IPR and all that, but I, we always had the impression that that has also been taken care of, but if there is any tweaking to be done, of course it can be done. But what I want to discuss with you 
is the prospect of con conducting tr clinical trials in India and looking promising, of course. In this light, what is the agency's perspective on the importance of international regulatory cooperation and collaboration, particularly involving clinical trial execution in India under International Council for Harmonization? So these guidelines are already established. What can India do to be able to participate more as a, a deserving, stable, and, and integrity of the data that comes out of India? Well, Narash, good to see you. How come you're not getting older? That's what I want to know. Um, but, uh, we, we, <laughs> Rob, we look good to each other. You ask an 18-year-old, how old we look as an ancient? So, uh, for those of you who wouldn't know this, um, I was sitting in my office one fine day in Durham, North Carolina, and my assistant knocked on the door and said, there's a gentleman out here named Dr. Trahan who flew from India to talk with you. He didn't call me and tell me he was coming. He showed up in person, and uh, our relationship uh, went on from there. And I did learn uh, a lot from uh, my time in India. I I'll just say a couple of things, Narash. Not Number one, um, you know that my history is I believe that clinical trials should be done everywhere because we all need representative samples in our clinical trials. That includes the United States. So I'm on, uh, I have a written record of saying I'm not in favor of offshoring, that is using financial arbitrage to do experiments in other populations because the wealthy countries don't want to do the exper experiments in their own countries. But if I lived in India, I would want clinical trials done in my population, just like if I lived in the U.S., I would want clinical trials done in the U.S. population. And so the way to do that is to work, work together and in some cases do single global clinical trials like I used to do for a living. That was my main academic pursuit. But in many cases, I think federated data is going to be the way to go because there are reasons you want to do sizable trials in your own you got, what, 1.6 billion people now almost, and um, yeah, th there's a real need. So the way to, to make federation work is to have common agreement on what the standards should be. And while SDH is a great way to do the standards, we are going to need to evolve to this more uh, use of electronic records and more facile, less expensive ways of doing research so that we can do trials that are adequate size, not just to prove the principle that the drug might work in a certain population, but to give the information that we talked about before, what's the what's the actual benefit across the population of eligible patients? What are the risks across that population? And um, increasingly, I think the comparative effectiveness, which again, is not the primary FDA issue, but as we work together, uh, federating this knowledge is going to be really important. So I look forward to working with you all. And like I say, I hope to be there in the fall to nail down some of our relationship. Uh, the India relationship is critical to us. And I can't mention that without mentioning generic drugs too. There might be a question later about generics, so I'll stop there. But it's important for us to talk about that. You know, in this regard, uh, um, India is... ICH um, observer and not an active participant. And so, you know, I guess the question would be, how does the FDA work with India to try to encourage m more participation so that these ICH standards could be more uh, international? So, I, you know, yeah. you have well, we, we'll, we'll just need to spend time talking and figuring out the best avenue to make that happen and i plan to do that um as i say with personal visits but also uh an emphasis i you know it it i think it's obvious to everyone that the u.s india relationship is particularly critical right now to us for a whole variety of reasons so one one last question related to india is is um the the idea that there's been increased use of remote uh on-site inspections. I, I guess part of that was uh, pandemic related, um, but this has led to more withheld applications and import uh, uh, alerts. So how can the industry actually be better prepared for these remote inspections? 
Uh, and the FDA empower the site, for instance, to proactively identify and, uh, and, and, and deal with these and solve these compliance issues. And that, that is a, uh, that's a long, you're, you're uh, asking a bunch of questions that we could talk for two hours about each question. I'm spending a lot of time on this right now. I mean, first of all, I'd say the industry needs to um, support us as we go to Congress and try to get the authority to ask, for example, for remote records across the board. If you're running a quality shop and manufacturing a drug, your records should be up to date all the time. So um, there shouldn't be a problem with making those available. That could enable us to use um, methods, including AI, to um, target our uh, human investigations where they're going to be most productive uh, and useful. So, um, I, I, you know, we're very much focused on systems quality, as if you're running a, a manufacturing plant or you're doing clinical trials. The question, you, you know, a spot inspection is just a spot inspection, but we should be able to use surveillance across the board, target the um, human inspections and keep the system at a high level of quality. So um, let, let's come to the table and keep uh, working on that. Part and parcel of that, of course, is um, we got to get over the idea that a spot inspection is also a punitive primary right. action. Sometimes when bad things are going on, uh, you do have to be punitive, but the main purpose is to produce a quality product with accurate information. And so just like companies should have internal auditing to make that happen, um, corrective action should be something that we don't have to wait a year to come back physically. We should be able to follow it virtually the way we're doing right now on this call. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Um, let's go on. Uh, Susan Hockfell has, has, is the president emerita of MIT you know, and she has a question about uh, public bad and misinformation about medicines. Susan? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and uh, Rob, thank you for uh, protecting our lives and uh, keeping us all healthy. Listen, you touched on this in your introductory comments, but I really appreciate hearing more of your thinking because it's, you know, I'm, I'm quite confused about it myself. So the industry is mandated to provide truthful and non-misleading information about its medications. And of course, we want to trust the integrity of our governmental agencies. But there is a very disturbing rise in the dissemination of inaccurate, misleading information in all domains, but certainly regarding FDA-approved drugs. And I have to tell you, this trend really complicates the sponsor's responsibility to combat this kind of activity. And even more importantly, it undermines public confidence in biomedicine and therapeutics. And I wonder if you have thoughts about how the FDA can help address this really quite harmful and corrosive phenomenon. Well, I've been quite outspoken about this, as you probably know. And across the board, I think, you know, I've said misinformation is the leading cause of premature death in the U.S. I actually believe that's true. There's no way to prove it. And so people have taken me to task, like, how can you prove that? Well, I can't prove it. But I think if you look at COVID deaths, you know, almost all COVID deaths now occurring, people are not up to date on their vaccination and have not gotten antiviral. If we look at heart disease, um, opioids, tobacco, the leading causes of death, um, they're heavily um, influenced by people not getting the treatments they need, often being misled by people giving counter narratives. Um, we do have a draft guidance from 2014 that basically says, um, if you're a company and you're um, being directly attacked with misinformation, you have the ability to respond um, within the boundaries that we all know or the limits of the kind of statements that companies can make. But we're gonna have to figure out within a country where the First Amendment is the First Amendment for a good reason, um, how to deal with it. I'm very taken with some things that have recently been written that um, our founders, actually, if you go back historically, apparently regarded the vast geography of the U.S. as an actual um, positive impediment to bad information spreading and taking over the country because it was hard to collude with bad information. But now there can be collusion immediately over the Internet 
It's that was opinion. before Twitter. Opinion's opinion. <laughs> right. And so um, the courts have their own views of this and federal agencies have limits. But um, we can't let misinformation go. Um, and, and it includes pre-bottle, that is dealing with it prospectively and also dealing with it um, as it happens. So stay tuned. We need to talk about this more. Thank Thanks, you very Robert. much. Thank you. Uh, let's go on uh, to a question that Chris Viebacher has regarding rare and ultra rare diseases. Chris, unmute yourself and Thank you, Bill. Um, Commissioner, thanks. We, we recently received approval for a product called Tefersin, um, which will hopefully help um, ALS patients with the SOD1 um, mutation. There are fewer than 500 uh, patients probably in the U.S., and I really just discovered this coming into uh, Biogen, but I've been really moved by the plight of people with ultra-rare diseases. And I look at the, the resources that Biogen was able to, to put against that and develop this medicine, but you know, it's, pretty, it's a pretty dissuasive economic argument for, for pretty much everybody else. And I was wondering, you know, when we have a population where it's hard to get a lot of data and hard to get a lot of statistical significance, any thoughts on how we can facilitate you know, clinical research? And, and I'm asking you not only as commissioner of the FDA, but as a clinical trialist yourself, how do we actually find a more cost-effective way to, to help these folks and, and get more medicines to them? Sure. Thanks, Chris. I, I, uh, you know, like I said, I don't. Nothing keeps me awake at night. But if I was going to stay awake at night, it is the plight of these people. Where now, we all have good reason to think that science can provide, um, if not cures, um, palliative treatments that allow people to live longer. Um, with, with a chronic disease as opposed to dying in childhood, for example. So we don't want to hold that up. And I think we firmly believe that at the FDA, and I speak for the center directors here because we talk about it a lot. Um, I'd say a couple of things. First, uh, we're going to have to come up with new methods, both for analysis and um, trial conduct for these ultra-rare diseases and even for rare diseases. Um, because the way we do it now is too expensive and it's going to limit uh, the number of cures. But on the other hand, um, I don't know if it's, uh, it's hard to put these things on a scale, but telling someone you have an effective treatment when it's really not effective or the risks outweigh the benefits is weighs heavily on our conscience at the same time. So we all need to work together on the methods. And it's it sort of get, and, and I'll say again, it is time for clinical research to change, to take advantage of technology the way other areas of society have done it. And it's gonna take a concerted effort, but I'm, I'm highly uh, excited about the potential for the changes at NIH, for example, that could help make this happen. Because for a lot of what you're talking about, there's specialty um, centers and university academic medical centers where patients get referred and if we get them going with methods to take advantage of the electronic data they're already taking, the amount of money you got to spend to verify the data and independently collect it and all, I think, could be dramatically revert, uh, reduced. And then we've got to keep in mind that when we do things like gene editing, we need uh, decades of follow-up. And if we tell you to do the follow-up the way it's currently being done, one patient at the time with all the checks and balances, it just puts it out of the realm of possibility because we don't know what the long-term effects of gene editing are going to be because of complex combinations of off-target genes that when you change one you don't know what's going to happen to the summative effects of the others that shouldn't hold us back but we just need a measurement system that does it and it it sort of gets at you know what i think the way people should think about the fda in general we're like referees um <laughs> The rules are set by Congress in the United States. We have input into the rule book, which interprets the rules. Basically, we're um, cheering on when someone does a good job and there's an effective treatment. You see a celebration at the FDA, just like occurs on the outside world. When someone tries to cheat or not play by the rules or take shortcuts that could endanger people, that's where, you know, as good referees, we need to 
be um, vigilant. So we need new methods. Um, thanks to the user fees, we're hiring, I think, 150 new people in the Center for Biologics to work on this. If you got friends that are ready for public service, send them our way. We're hiring right now. And um, we really welcome uh, smart people coming in and helping us figure this out. I think it's a really exciting time. I mean, things that we thought were impossible a few years ago now can be done. Hey, Rob, uh, we're just about out of time, but I just have a quickie question, okay? You're, you're Coach K or Coach S, okay? And uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, what, what would your top priority be in order to make sure that FDA is the winning team? Just off the top of your head, what, what is the first priority that you would have? I, I think the number one thing for me right now, so uh, let me just say two things. One is we got to get it right about what our authorities are to um, function. The, the very basic authorities we have are under question right now. Uh, we were heartened by the letter from industry about um, the court case with Miffy. And, you know, I can't go into detail about that, as we said. But given that, the number one thing is communication. Um, we got 19,000 people. We got all sorts of people taking shots at us every day. Um, people have a right in the United States to criticize federal agencies. They should. In order for us to do well, we got to have our internal story straight, communicating well internally, and also communicating with the outside world, which is um, hard to do because we have limits in what we can spend on people to help us with our um, communications. So translation of science into plain English, and I'll add now Spanish, which is really a requirement in the United States, um, absolutely essential that we have to get better at. But it's just as just as important internally as it is externally. Uh, I will. You you mentioned Coach K. Um, I had a situation the other day inside the FDA where I said, if this were Coach K, he would say, "Show up at my house at midnight tonight, and you're not going home until we got this sorted out. Until we're all working together as a team." That's and that's, I, that's the way we got to That's good news. Hey, Rob, on behalf of of the summit. Uh, we thank you. Uh, we've already thank you and your efforts on behalf of all of our patients. But we appreciate your time and comments. And perhaps you'll come back and visit again with us sometime. Oh yeah, so Bill, thanks. And I do want to mention, in the in the vein of referees celebrating the new Alzheimer's results released today, um, this is just magnificent for a disease that's affected so many people. And it's not just these results. They're very consistent with the results that we had already seen. So we are we are cheering on here at the FDA. You know, we'll have to see. As you know, we have to look at the data when it comes in before making a judgment. But if the data look as good as the press release, um, this is really, really exciting. Thank you, Rob. Take care. Thank you much. Thank you, Rob. Just in time for, for us, Rob. This Alzheimer is just in time for us, so. Well, thank you very much, Bill, and thank you very much, Rob. And I, I love the idea of us having a chief referee at the in the government. And actually, if, if I use an umpire signal, it's it's this. That <laughs> that fireside chat, as, as baseball umpires do, that was a home run. It was over the wall. So thank you very much, mm -hmm. Bill, and thank you very much, Rob. So let's move now, before we move to our next panel, let's move to the our poll, our next polling question. And if I could have our folks uh, pull that up. So really simple, following that panel. In the next year, the number of accelerated approvals will A, decrease, B, stay the same, or C, increase. We'll look forward to hearing all of your thoughts. So please, please participate in the poll. Let's pull up the results of the polling question that we just had, please. All right, great. Actually, uh, again, optimism in our audience, which is terrific to see. So. 50% um, of those polls think that over the next year, the number of accelerated approvals will increase. So that's really terrific to see that optimism.